Welcome to an interweb view this morning. And uh, we certainly have a very interesting topic, which is foot sanitizers and methods to eliminate uh, uh, health acquired infections and uh, among them coronavirus. And so we have some people with us here who uh, are very knowledgeable about the product and uh, are going to tell us uh, what we need to know. So let me start with Charlie Rodriguez, who's the sales director. Do you want to give us a little of your background, Charlie? Yeah, I, um, my name's Charlie Rodriguez. I come from the cleaning industry prior to joining Pathogen Solutions. Um, you know, Pathogen Solutions is a revolutionary ozone plus UVC disinfectant technology. It's the first and only product of footwear sanitation that utilizes a patented combination of ozone and UV to destroy, you know, 99.99% of deadly pathogens in you know, six, eight, and 10 second intervals. Um, what it does is um, helps destroy uh, on, on the bottom of shoe soles, uh, anything that may, might lead to HAIs, which is healthcare associated infections. So my background in the cleaning industry, I've been doing it for the last four years. I was a regional director for a large clean, uh, nationwide cleaning company, and I decided to join Pathogen Solutions to help launch or really to promote this product throughout the United States. Yeah, it seems uh, that a good area of conversation for us would be, uh, you know, where you would uh, install these foot sanitizers in addition to the tacky mats that are used in a lot of uh, clean rooms or in re a replacement of so maybe we'll hold that till uh, to the end but I think that is an interesting uh, uh, topic to discuss uh, Robin Collins absolutely vice, uh, yeah Robin Collins is the vice president of sales would you like to give us a little of your background sure my pleasure Bob I have been in the healthcare space um, for um, over 30 years and my background is um, I started my career with Merck and I did a number of different things, including marketing and strategic planning and sales, sales leadership, and then spent 10 years with Guidant Corporation. Uh, Guidant was one stop shopping for cardiovascular technologies and um, held a number of different roles there in marketing and sales as well. Um, after Guidant got sold off, to Boston Scientific and Abbott Vascular. I moved on to a number of different startup companies, including a few other companies in the infection prevention space. I had the opportunity to be introduced by a mutual friend to the original founder and inventor of our Pathogen Solutions footwear sanitizing station. Um, about six years ago, I helped him in the very early days with venture capital, um, also with um, mar go to market strategy, marketing collaterals, sales collaterals, et cetera. And then sadly, he became ill and um, he uh, needed to retire. So he went his way, I went mine. And then about a year and a half ago, the current owners of the intellectual property um, called me and I have been engaged with the organization ever since. Very, uh, very good, interesting background. Yeah, the. Uh... I sit on the board of directors with uh, one of the uh, a retired technical director uh, of Merck, and uh, you, know, you know it certainly occurs to me that pharmaceutical companies are going to be a, a big uh, a potential market for you people as well, will they not? Yes, they will. Yeah. Well, I think with that we uh, can get into the uh, actual discussion of the uh, product. So I'm going to pull that on up. And just so you know, Bob, some of these slides build, so um, if you could help drive, I'd greatly appreciate it. Yeah, well, I'll be indexing them as you uh, would like me to do so. Um, so, um, you know, just, you can just say next or whatever. Great. So our company is Pathogen Solutions. We are privately held startup. Our technology has been on the market for about a year, headquartered in St. Petersburg, Florida. And our product is manufactured in Tampa. So moving on to the next slide, just want to briefly talk about healthcare associated infections because 
um, as you mentioned, this technology is perfect for many different markets, not just healthcare. Um, and we'll address that a little bit later on. But specific to healthcare, we know that there are approximately 1.7 million HAIs annually. Over 100,000 people die per year. In terms of the cost in the economy, um, in excess of 35 billion, and the cost of one uh, HAI is $22,000, and that is just the direct cost. And on the average, a patient who acquires a healthcare-associated infection while in the hospital will stay for 19.2 days. Yeah, those are pretty impressive numbers, although um, we're, uh, we did a, uh, a deep dive for Cardinal Health here some years ago and, and uh, to analyze the social costs, the life, what we call the life quality aspects and um, of, of, of these diseases. And, uh, the, and then EPA has come up with a number of, for every death, they've, they've got a basic number of 10 million uh, dollars that they use in any of their uh, cost justifications. So on that basis, you know, that 99,000 deaths, when you add uh, uh, the 10 million that EPA puts in plus the another uh, 20 million uh, of uh, additional life quality reductions, you're really talking $3 trillion in cost to these uh, infections. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the 35 billion to the economy is a pretty small number when you look at a, a, a total impact of, of over $3 trillion. And uh, we have uh, uh, a very extensive initiative that we're, we have underway here to analyze all that. And, uh, and actually it shows that sort of something like the foot sanitizers, uh, you know, the cost can be justified in just a day or two uh, if, if, uh, if some of the uh, performance that uh, is purported actually is, uh, is, 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 turns out to be true. You know, great insight, Bob. And I would love to get um, that data from you so that we can update our slides and speak to that. Yeah, I'll certainly see that uh, that you get that. Great. So before we get into talking about our footwear sanitizing station, just want to take a couple minutes and talk about um, why floors and shoes are an issue. Um, this graphic was developed um, from a scientific article that appeared in um, hospital, con excuse me, infection control and hospital epidemiology back in 2016. And the authors were Drs. Koganti, Donsky, and others. And Dr. Donsky is a world renowned infectious disease physician. Um, what they did was they took a non pathogenic viral marker and they put it on the floor of 10 patients' room. This was approved by the Veterans Administration IRB in Cleveland. The staff was blinded, so they did not know the study was going on. What they did was they monitored the spread of that marker in a, over a three-day period, and as soon as day one, within the first 24 hours, the pathogens spread all over the patient's room. As you can see here, 100% of the footwear um, was, in, was um, contaminated with this non-pathogenic marker. But also, if you continue to forward on this slide, you'll see animations which ju jump out here, and you can continue to do that. And, you know, it, it ended up spreading all over the patient's room. On, and You can keep going. Um, we've got, um, you can go again. And, yeah, so it was virtually everywhere in the patient's room. Um, and on the patient's hands, on the call button, on the chair. And what we know is that pathogens can live on surfaces for a very long time. And all a patient or a visitor or a healthcare worker needs to do is touch the pathogen and touch their nose or their mouth, and they can become infected if, it, if this was a, a pathogenic um, issue. So, um, in addition to the, path, the non-pathogenic marker spreading all over the patient's room, it also spread to the nurse's station, to adjacent room, and to portable equipment. So you can see that what's on floors and what's on shoes frequently spreads everywhere. 
So this was a study that was conducted by the University of South Florida. Um, and what it showed was that over 75% of the soles of shoes that walked into a Tampa Bay area hospital had MRSA C. difficile and other pathogens on them, and that they estimated more than 4 million pathogen units were carried into the hospital on the soles of shoes every day. After exposure to our technology for eight seconds, uh, they were able to demonstrate that our technology killed 99.95% of the MRSA and 97.5% of the C. diff. So here is the clinical case study. We launched the technology about a year ago, the very first hospital in the United States to evaluate the technology was Advent Health Connerton. You can go ahead and um, move on to the first bullet, um, and then the second bullet. Advent Health Connerton is a long-term acute care hospital. Um, patients that leave an acute care hospital on the average uh, go to Advent Health Connerton for 26 days. They're very sick patients, ventilator dependent, and their goal is to maximize infection prevention and control to protect their patients. Next bullet. They have nine stations throughout the facility. At the time that the evaluation began, they were a 50 bed facility, a relatively small hospital. They were embarking on construction, adding an additional 25 beds, but the concern was that the data support that uh, during construction, infection rates could go up, and they certainly didn't want that to happen. So the good news is, next bullet, their infection rates dropped. Um, during construction, 34% for the period February through August. What's also impressive, they had a 92% employee satisfaction rating. There are many studies which show a correlation between employee satisfaction and patient satisfaction. And what was also good was there were no slip and falls related to the units. And this is since February last year, all nine units are still there. You can see the pictures below. In the second picture, you can see someone standing on the unit. And what you can see is behind where they're standing and in front of it, there's a ramp. That's to try to help minimize slip and falls. In addition to sitting on top of the floor, the units can also be built into the floor. And then lastly, but importantly, especially for clean rooms, uh, the pharmacy wanted um, one or actually two for their clean room area. And um, as a result of having the unit in there and other infection prevention and control measures, their last pharmacy air and surfaces samples were negative for any pathogens. Um, what's really cool, Bob, is um, all of this information is going to be included in a white paper uh, this coming summer. We've partnered with Crawfel Healthcare. They're a partner with Advent Health, and they will be highlighting the results of this study um, including a quote from Jeffrey Miley, who is the Director of Pharmacy at Advent Health Connerton. And then this is that quote. Yeah. Which just reiterates, their success in that reality is they've changed their protocols requiring each employee who enters the clean room to sanitize their shoes. Yeah, it's uh, certainly very impressive. One one question, just technology-wise, you, you, you've got uh, air that is uh, moving all around the room and in, uh, you know, for, for those of us who are just getting oriented to it, the visual, visualizing how the uh, pathogens get onto all these other surfaces from the from the uh, floor, I would assume one way is some of the surface uh, pathogens are swept up and, and then deposited elsewhere. Uh, are there other explanations? Just, uh, uh, I, I suppose uh, anything that comes in contact with the floor and then comes in contact with these other surfaces is another way that it's carried. Uh, did, yeah. Yeah. There, there are those 
scientists who believe that what is on the floor can also aerosolize. Mm -hmm. As people are walking, it can be kicked into the air and circulated. Right. That's certainly the common, uh, and I think that the, the common principle uh, in uh, in clean rooms is, uh, you know, is the, the awareness that uh, these, these particles do settle, settle and then are air, airborne very easily. Uh, again, anything that's a small aerosol and some of these, uh, like coronavirus is down in the 0.1 micron uh, range. And um, it's been proven that uh, uh, that these aerosol droplets can can be airborne for uh, very long distances and for very long times in, at that size range. So it, it's not it's not a, a hard sell to to realize that this is probably what, what some of what's happening anyway. Yeah, excuse me for interrupting. We totally agree. Move on, I guess then. So. Absolutely. So in addition to pathogens um, living in the air for a period of time, we also know that they can survive on surfaces. Um, as you can see here, C. diff can survive on surfaces for five months. If you go down, MRSA, seven days to seven months. SARS, um, coronavirus, and actually um, um, COVID-19, can survive on surfaces. The data for SARS coronavirus is 72 hours to 28 days. And I've seen different reports with regards to COVID-19. Do you have any of your own data on surfaces for COVID-19? Yeah, we have some of that same data data uh, uh, and long, you know, certainly the 72 hours and, and beyond uh, is, is pretty well documented. Yeah. So well, let's go ahead to the next slide then. Um, in addition to being proven highly effective in the uh, clinical setting, we're also we've also got a couple of studies showing that we're highly effective in the lab setting. And NSF Applied Research Center is a private lab, um, an independent lab in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And this was a study they conducted testing both um, percent reduction and also log reduction in treating a number of different pathogens, both fungus and bacteria. And what they saw for Candida auris, a fungus, 99.9993% um, or in excess of five log reduction. And as you go down, you can see very consistently the technology is highly effective. Yes, certainly impressive numbers there. And um, the technology was tested by them at six, eight, and 10 seconds. And you can see here um, that overall, the longer someone's on the unit, the more effective. But in some situations, eight seconds was just as good as 10 seconds. Um, and, and then, um, we can move on. Yeah, but for, before we do that, I just wanted to orient people uh, who are familiar with some of these UV studies that show relatively long uh, durations required to kill the, the, the viruses, but it's a function of distance. And in this case, you've got the the soles of the feet very close to the uh, to the uh, the the ozone and, and UV light, so. Uh, this would be a reason that the eight or 10 seconds would be so uh, effective. Is, is that correct? It, I'll exactly, answer that. Yeah, it's all about time and distance. Uh, so yeah, the, just like you, you're, you're stating, Bob, the, you know, the UV light in the rooms, I've seen the robots and, you know, they, they don't, they don't hit every place. And just like you said, it's time and it's time and, and location and distance. And um, it doesn't hit everything in the room. Um, this, really as you step on this it continues to kill even after you step on it and, and if you're going from like let's say you walk into a hospital bedroom and then you go straight to the bathroom typically the robots aren't hitting the bathroom at all um when you know when when they put them up and the you know you, you get loss of use so you have 30 minutes 45 minutes depends on the time that they leave them in the hospital room uh, for it to actually work um and and the fact that we also use ozone 
um, is it's a huge difference from what the robots bring to the table because we, you know, we're able to crack the outer capsid of any of those pathogens, and then we let the, and get the UV light in there, um, and that's what makes it so so quick, where we can do it in six, eight, and ten in, uh, second intervals. Good point. Yeah. Right. So I'm sure you were wondering about COVID-19. Um, are we effective in treating COVID-19? And um, we will send you um, some follow-up information. We know that both ozone and UVC have been proven to kill viruses, including the SARS coronavirus. An independent lab, Kremco, in Ontario, Canada, completed a study just last week on the effectiveness of our technology um, in killing the human coronavirus 229E. And actually, um, what they found was that um, we had 100% kill based on the expectations of the study. Yeah, that'll be very interesting to get the details of that study. And we certainly uh, will make the viewers of this uh, uh, video uh, aware of those results when we get them from. Excellent. Yeah, the, the um, methodology of this study was they actually did two tests. The first test was um, the, the um, challenge was for a 3.68 log reduction. And the second test was for a 3.73, excuse me, log 10. Um, and we were able to achieve the maximum attainable result at both eight and 10 seconds. Yeah, impressive results. So, I beg your pardon? I say impressive results. Thank you. So you, in addition to the technology being highly effective, it's also super easy to use. All you have to do is plug it in and go. There's no warm up time. It doesn't require any additional personnel. Um, here you see an image with someone standing on the unit. When the unit is ready, uh, the ready light, which is a little blurry, but it's in the upper left hand corner, it comes on. The person stands on it, and if you advance to the next, the system is activated. So it's only activated for the seconds that it's in use. Then the system counts down, it beeps, and the ready light comes back on, and that's all there is to it. So Char Charlie alluded to this um, a few minutes ago. Uh, ozone and UVC together are a very powerful and potent combination. What's nice is that ozone creates holes in the cell walls, and then after those holes are created, uh, um, the UVC denatures the cell at the DNA level. And so consequently, that's what enables the technology to kill up to 99.999% of the deadliest superbugs in just seconds. The CDC cites that within hours after disinfecting floors, whether it's done um, with a floor disinfectant or a UV robot, that the floors are back to pretreatment levels. And this is for a number of different reasons. Um, it's partly because the pathogens regrow and also because people start walking on the floors again, rolling wheelchairs and other portable equipment. So with both the floor disinfections and UVC, because they don't have ozone, the pathogens can regenerate, but with our pathogen solutions technology, it limits the regeneration by denaturing the DNA. So you may want to wonder, you may be wondering, excuse me, where you might want to put these in a hospital. We're recommending placing them at entrances and exits because we know that uh, people carry in pathogens and at one hospital alone, more than 4 million pathogens were carried into that hospital each and every day. In addition to the perimeters of the entrances and exits, next slide. You can put them outside the OR, ICU, staff locker rooms, pharmacy, um, cafeteria, I mean, just 
the places are endless. Yeah, things like the pharmacy, if they're doing compounding of drugs, uh, are obviously very, very critical, aren't they? Uh, without question. More so than ever. So in summary, um, we protect the vulnerable in the hospital setting and otherwise, including immunocompromised patients, oncology patients, the young and, el and elderly, and very important healthcare workers. And we reduce the microbial load and bio burden. Um, once visitors are allowed back in hospitals, we'll be able to increase community involvement in infection prevention. Um, where we help in employee satisfaction as well as patient satisfaction. And ultimately, we believe it will be very easy for anyone who invests in the technology to get a significant return on their investment quickly. So um, I think at this point, we can talk about some other areas where the technology may be useful. Let's, let's do that. The, uh, so, um, yes. Go ahead. Um, you meant, we, we, talked, um, we talked about clean rooms, pharmaceutical companies, um, absolutely critical areas, and actually, uh, clean room technologies featured an article about our, our technology and company about a year ago. And they're getting ready to do an updated article to share the results that we experienced in the pharmacy, but also in all areas of the hospital at Advent Health Connerton. Oh, that'll be a very, uh, very interesting. So that's, that's clean room technology out of the UK that, that's going to be. Uh, it, yes, it is. Uh, okay, yeah. So they're. Okay, in addition to. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, in, in addition to clean rooms, um, food processing, an important area, um, cruise ships right now, grocery stores, hotels, hospitality, sports Airport. arenas, airports, yep. Airport. I'm sorry? I said the airplane industry. Totally, airplane industry, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the markets are endless. Our company right now is primarily focused on clean rooms and healthcare, healthcare being not only hospitals, um, but also senior living communities, nursing homes, rehab centers, and, I, and the cruise industry. But it seems like there's an absolutely huge market, and I would like to say, you know, what happens if, you know, the, uh, for instance, the president of the United States is presently saying, you know, we've got to get back to, to work. But uh, when you look at the potential of uh, 150,000 people dying in the United States, if we follow the just even the Italian curves, you know, the cost to the economy uh, uh, as well as social costs is going to be many times what our annual GDP is. But on the other hand, if we can get people back to work and reduce some of those uh, risks, and this would be one way to do it, there uh, is, a, is a very high uh, return on the in invested capital. So, uh, so just on some of these economics, how many practically, if it's every eight or nine seconds, how many people per Minute. Let's say you have a big automobile plant that wants to get back to work, and yet they don't want to have transmission, you know, among the workers on the assembly lines and so forth there. And this would be one of the things they'd want to do. But the question is, you've got several thousand people coming to work. How many of these do you need? Uh, you know, or, and I suppose we have to be innovative and say, well, we're going to uh, not have everybody come in and start, you know, have our shifts all staggered so that. You have people coming in continually and going through the uh, the health uh, requirement uh, procedures protocols, but uh, in, in I any, think yeah. Sorry, Bob. I I think it, with something like that, obviously, if they have any type of corporate office or office setting where people are in closer contact, um, they would need you know foot sanitations in those areas. 
if they're following the guidelines that the CDC has put forward where, you know, people are working, but they're not, you know, they're staying six feet apart. Um, you, you definitely want them in the assembly areas where people are, you know, walking into the assembly areas, but they could probably be spread out over different distances as long as they, they make it a point that everybody has to step on something like that. Um, if you're getting into confined spaces, you're getting into these class A large office buildings where, you know, people are on top of each other, people are in the elevators together, people are at the cafes together. Those places like that, they're good to have at just the entrance levels. Like, uh, like for instance, our building in San Pete, there's three entrances. Uh, so maybe having two per entrance, that way people, you know, with signs and, and advertisement, hey, this is the new, the new norm. You have to step on this before you enter our building. Um, that is, it, it's really dependent on the type of location it is and, the, and how close you are relative to, you know, your, 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 your other employees. So hospital setting, you have people, you know, you want them all over the place because you have people that are coming in sick. You have, like Robin said, people bringing in 4 million pathogens um, and then walking out with them. Um, but different locations would, would you know, ensue different types of where we would put the product to really ensure its maximum benefit. And let's say we're talking, uh, you know, for $20,000 per, uh, per station. And, uh, you know, how many, are you, is it a couple people a minute? Was, is that a practical number to go through? Is it one a minute? Uh, what, you know, what? Well, if it's eight seconds um, per person. Go ahead, sorry, Robin. No worries. Um, yeah, actually, our list price is $28,900. Uh -huh. um, in terms of, of workflow, um, and actually our price is negotiable based on quantity, we can discount it. And we are approved um, by Premier, one of the largest healthcare GPOs in the U.S., as breakthrough technology, and we provide them um, discount pricing based on volume right now. But in terms of workflow, we, um, we, we've had that issue at a number of hospitals, especially operating rooms. And one thing that they can do is they can um, stagger um, arrival and departure times and um, just have people instead of coming in all at the same time, come in five minutes apart and still get everybody in and going in relatively uh, short amount of time. So are we talking maybe one person every couple of minutes or what, you know, what, what's kind of a reasonable uh, time frame to go through this protocol and, and still leave time for the next person to move into it? I would say reasonably five, five people per minute. Oh, five people per minute. And that okay. just get, yeah, it, it's only eight seconds. Yeah, yeah. So and yet they, pretty, you know. Pretty high volume then uh, and. Uh, and with some of the, the, the data that we, we've certainly been coming up with, you only have to save, uh, you know, one life every hundred years or something like that to uh, justify uh, this kind of expenditure. So it, uh, and I, you know, I, I think it's a whole new paradigm here uh, of uh, how the, the United States and every other country around the world is going to function in the future. Uh, you know, I, I visualize us normally wearing masks to work and, uh, doing all sorts of things we wouldn't have conceived of, of doing uh, previously. And certainly uh, steps like this seem to be uh, uh, very, very cost effective. We agree. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, and, and just to kind of piggyback on what Robin said, if, if you know, anybody was interested in this product, it, it, depending on how many, um, you were to get, I mean, I think we, you and I and and my COO, Scott Beal, had a uh, conversation the other day that it, it, it can, from 28, like literally pay about half of that, depending on how many they order. If they were to order, you know, one to five, it'd probably be on the higher range. And obviously anything above that is, is you know, it's very negotiable. And I guess the other major thing is that if this did scale up where, you know, you're talking about, and, and just to give you a, a, the scale of what's going on, uh, there on mass there were um, uh, 20 million masks per day being produced in the world uh, uh, on January 1, and 
10 million out of those 20 million masks were being being produced in China. China today is producing 200 million masks a day. So I think, you know, we're breaching levels of healthcare investment that uh, were just inconceivable just three months ago. Uh, can you imagine going from 10 million to 200 million and just uh, three months every autumn, all the big automobile manufacturers are making masks and and Sinopec, the biggest uh, chemical company in the world, is not only furnishing the polypropylene, but they are working with the media companies and the mass companies and so forth, and have got ten lines themselves. So, uh, you know, I, I just think we're we start going to have to start thinking in proportions, which are uh, ones we haven't even thought of before. And, and so that leads to my final question there: How? How much of a problem would it be to ramp up your production to where it's, uh, you know, some ge geometric multiple of what you've been uh, uh, producing otherwise? The good news, Bob, is um, we, all of our parts are manufactured here in the U.S. Um, our manufacturer is actually in Tampa right now. We are looking at alternatives because since we've gotten the COVID-19 data, which has only been days, the demand for the technology is very quickly, understandably so, um, ramping up. And um, so with that, we ha are coming up with alternate ways in order to very quickly beef up manufacturing so that we can, to the best of our ability, um, meet the demand that is out there and is going to continue to be out there as we become the standard of care in the future. So it, it's a challenge that you think you'll be uh, able to meet, uh, whatever the demands, there'll be a, you know, a, a way to do it? Not immediately. Um, we actually um, have such a demand that um, we, we will go on back order um, soon. And right now our turnaround times are four to five weeks and we've got to improve that. Um, but we will do everything we can and get as creative and partner with whoever we need to in order to meet the demand to help public health. And then uh, in terms of next steps here, would you want to just, uh, I think this terms uh, how you would proceed with a customer, do you want to uh, cover that as well? Yeah, actually this, this, apply, um, this applies on an exception basis, so we don't really need to go through this slide. Oh, okay. We do offer evaluations, but because of the crisis situation we're in, um, in most situations what we would do is we would understand a company's specific objectives where they think they w w would want to place units and just, just talk about terms with regards to based on quantities and their timing needs, um, how we can help address that. We provide them with a quote. Um, they provide us with a PO and we would work out final payment terms, ship their units and then right now because of the situation we would help remotely with regards to training and also with regards to insta installation. But we've got all that already set up and we can do that virtually with no problem. Yeah, that seems like it certainly uh, is something that can be done uh, remotely there. Yeah, I mean, it's a plug and play system. All, it doesn't even require warm up. They just plug it in, but training is very important. Um, and so it's definitely something that we intend to do uh, via Zoom, Skype, some some virtual way. Yeah, that certainly uh, seems very logical there. So I think it's been a very interesting uh, uh, presentation, and I, I we want to keep uh, in contact uh, with you here. Report on these results that uh, uh, are going to be available, specifically relative to the uh, the novel coronavirus. Uh, but since you know you've gotten those good results with the SARS, there probably is no reason not. And of course, you've already got preliminary results that show. Uh, that you're going to have that that has the successful uh, successful tests. So, uh, 
you know, yeah, so actually, we do have the final results, and we'll get those to you right away. Oh, okay. That's great. And we'll, uh, along with the write-up of this, we'll then include those as, as well. And uh, Great. I, I'd like to thank, thank both of you here. It's been a very, uh, very interesting uh, interview, and we'll look forward to working with you in the, in the future. We look forward to working with you and Ross as well, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I really Thank appreciate you. it.